Hello again. In uh, the previous video, we took a look at Zechariah chapter 1 and 2. And in th this video, we're going to continue with Zechariah. Now, Zechariah has a, a few different visions in his book. The first vision is from chapter 1 until chapter 7. Uh, we've already looked at chapter uh, 1 and 2, so in this video I'm going to try to cover chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6. So this video is going to go a bit longer, but this is, the, this is the meat of this vision, so I think it's important not to break it up into several videos. Now the first two chapters was sort of the setup for the vision that we covered in the last video. And we got to talk about Darius and the political atmosphere at the time. And we got to uh, discuss some of the symbols like the horses and the horns. And how God was jealous over Zion because the Persians were bringing peace to the earth and you can bet Satan had something to do with this and it was bringing a peace but not the peace that God has in mind and so God um, said uh, First of all, he called his people out of the daughter of Babylon to come to the daughter of Zion because God is raised up out of his holy habitation and Zion is being rebuilt and he's calling his people out of Babylon. And he also gives a warning here because he's saying, behold, I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. <clears throat> so, anybody who stays there is going to be um, caught up in, in what's going to happen to the daughter of Babylon. So, this is sort of the, what the first two chapters was setting up that now God is going to do this. Now we're going to get into a bit more of how he's going to do this and, and, and the events that are important. And this is where the high priest, the Levitical high priest comes into the picture once again. And as we know, uh, the builder and the governor of Jerusalem is named Zerubbabel. And the high priest is named Joshua, or Jeshua, or Jesus. It's all the same name. Starting in chapter 3, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So now we're looking at Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Now he's standing as the high priest and Satan is resisting him. So what, what is Satan saying to resist him? He's saying he's a sinner. He's not clean. He can't be the high priest. He's, he's polluted and there's no temple. You can't, he can't be clean. There's no way to do this, right? So this is Satan's resistance. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. So now we can see where Satan is the one setting up this peaceful kingdom in the earth. As, I guess, some kind of mockery to God. Or usually these tyrannical governments come in peacefully and once they have all the control then it turns into mayhem and, and genocide and things like that. So, you know, I guess God knows where this is going but most people don't yet. 
Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. So we know in Christianity, filthy garments is sin, and Jesus washes you and gives you a, a new white coat, a pure white coat, and which is uh, symbolic of his righteousness and uh, being free from sin. So he answered and spoke to those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him, so this is God uh, uh, speaking to the angels. Take away the filthy garments from him, and unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of clothing. So this is like Jesus talking. I, um, through the cross, the sacrifice on the cross, Jesus has caused the iniquity to pass from mankind, all those who confess his name. So God is sort of doing a preview of this. Okay, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you. I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. So what is a mitre? A mitre is uh, it's a, like a headdress. It's not a crown. A crown is for a king. A mitre is uh, like a bishop's headdress would be called a mitre. Or uh, like a wrapping with a diamond in the front. Or just any kind of a special headdress is a mitre. Starting in verse 6, And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house, and shall also keep my courts, and I will give you places to walk among those that stand by. And that is among the angels. <clears throat> Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your fellows that sit before you, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now I talked about this before, the branch. Um, we can take a quick look. There, you can, I could make a whole video about the branch. Uh, he appears several times in prophecy. And it's actually talking about Jesus. He's the branch from the root of David. We'll take a quick look at Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So that's the righteous branch, the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. And also, Jeremiah 33, 15. We'll take a quick look at that. There are um, several occurrences of the branch in Isaiah and in other prophecies. Uh, but just to get an idea of who the branch is. Jeremiah 33, 15. In those days and at that time, I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. So um, this is the son of David that will sit on the throne forever, as we have studied several times already. That was God's promise to David. So, back to Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. So now he's into the, 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 the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, Behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord of hosts, 
and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. So what was the one day when he removed the iniquity of the land? It was when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. That removed the iniquity. Uh, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Right? Okay. And verse 10. In that day says the Lord of hosts. You shall call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Every man is his brother, right? And that's the gospel message. So um, he's, he's alluding forward to the um, gospel message. Now in verse 9, he talks about the stone with the seven eyes. Um, <clears throat> if we bump ahead a bit in chapter 4, he, he, he refers back to the stone with seven eyes. And he gives a bit more information about what this is. Chapter 4, verse 10. This is referring to the same stone before, that is before the high priest. Verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. So these seven, the stone, okay, a plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. A plummet is uh, it's like a stone hanging from a string. Uh, we talked before about a measuring line used by a builder to, to make everything straight and level. A plummet if you hold a stone from a string, you can check straightness up and down like a, to see if things are level, to have the wall straight. So this is the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, and he's the builder. So that's the stone on the string to measure whether it's straight, the building. And it has seven eyes on it. And these are the eyes of God that look through the whole earth. So this is speaking of judgment. And in Christianity, um, the foundation is laid. So by the time of Darius' second year, when this prophecy is, is being given, the foundation of the temple has already been, been fixed. And... The now they're starting to build, they're starting to put in the timbers, and this is where he's going to use the plummet. In Christianity, Jesus is the foundation stone, and his gospel is the foundation, and Christians are the living stones that are built upon the foundation to build the new temple of God. And God is the, a spirit, and the people are his temple. So you are the temple of the living God. This is uh, what Paul teaches. Therefore, you take care of your body and you take care of the temple of God. So this is the, the, the seven eyes, the stone with seven eyes in the hand of Zerubbabel, who is building the temple. Well, who is building the temple in Christianity? Jesus is building the temple. And so now the, the seven eyes that are before the high priest who is building the temple, this is where we can relate it up on to the book of Revelation. And you have the seven churches, and each of those seven churches is, is like a, a judgment call of Jesus upon his church. You see, so the seven eyes are the seven lamps. The eye is the lamp of the body, right? So the seven lamps are the seven eyes, which relates directly to the seven churches. All right? And there's, there's more about Revelation in here as we get into chapter 4. So we've already covered chapter 3, so let's start on chapter 4. And... 
And the angel that talked with me came again and woke me as a man that is woken out of his sleep. And that is, okay, so what does this speak to? This speaks to someone who has received the Holy Spirit. And he's no longer sleeping. He's no longer walking, sleeping. He's alive. He's awake. Okay. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick, all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it. And his seven lamps on top and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which were on top of it. And two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side. And I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered and spoke to me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So this is by... Um, that Jesus didn't come with an army to take over the world. He came with the Spirit of God. So this is how God is going to build his kingdom to take over the world with his Spirit, right? Who are you, O great mountain? A mountain is uh, a big problem or, or a kingdom or something that has to be overcome. So... Who are you? So he's referring to Persia at this time. But you could classify it as even now any government, any, any entity that is against the kingdom of God. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone with shoutings crying grace unto it. So there shall be a, a, a great celebration at the laying of the headstone of this temple. And that was at the time of Christ. There was a great celebration. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So now we're, we're looking at Zerubbabel is also a, a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Jesus took on many offices, probably every office. But he took on the office of high priest. He's now taken on the office as the builder of the temple. So he laid the foundation at his crucifixion and he laid down the gospel and now he is the builder of um, people who confess his name become a part of his kingdom and he builds them into a holy temple who hold his spirit. Right? Okay. Starting in verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? So, these things happening way back in the past of this second temple being rebuilt, I suppose he's talking, that's the day of small things. That's only a symbol of what is coming, right? For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side of the candlestick? And I answered again and said to him, What are these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? So it seems like um, the, the Jews have a candlestick called the menorah. And that's a, a copy of the candlestick that was in the temple as one of the main articles of furniture in the temple. And the candlestick is like one base. It goes up like this and it has seven candles. Yeah, um, I'm sure everybody's seen that. And that this is the seven candlesticks he's talking about. 
And in this vision, there's an olive tree on each side of it and two bowls at the top. And the olive oil is coming out of the trees and flowing into the bowls. And the candles are being burned. They're burning olive oil. And he answered me and he said, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And then he said, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The two anointed ones. Well, we can go back to Revelation again. Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses. And there was given to me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship in it. So we're talking about the temple is the people who are the living stones built upon as, as, as upon the foundation, which is Jesus, right? Okay. Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, okay? But the court, which is without the temple, leave it out, measure it not. For it is given to the Gentiles and the holy city, they shall tread underfoot 42 months, which is 1260 days, which is three and a half years. Um, this, this is a time period which is an extremely important time period in, pro in prophecy. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man hurts them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So um, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and overcome them and kill them. So this is, you know, pretty famous prophecy about the two witnesses. And this is the sixth trumpet um, in, um, in Revelation. There's seven seals and he un does the seven seals of this scroll that he receives from the throne of God, Jesus, who is the Lamb of God. And the seventh seal is seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet is seven vials of plagues. So this is the sixth trumpet, the two witnesses. This will be a whole different study to look at the two witnesses in Revelation. But these two candles, these, this candlestick with the seven lamps being fed from the two trees that are giving the oil. Uh, the olive oil is like the Holy Spirit, which, is, which, which runs through the candle and lights the light. And the light is the, the lamp of the eyes. And it's the light of the world. In the, in the world, the gospel is the light of the world. So this is talking about by my spirit, the world will be overcome. So um, the, the two, these are the two anointed ones. Okay. So what are the anointed ones? Messiah. These are the two Messiah, these two trees that are feeding the oil into the lamps are the two Messiahs that stand before the God of the whole earth. So what are the two Messiahs? Well, we just looked at one Messiah as uh, Joshua, the high priest, who has been purified from sin and given a mitre on his head. The other Messiah is coming up soon. It's Joshua the king, right? So you, we'll, we'll show this later where Jesus is the high priest and the king. He's the two. Um, now, whether Revelation makes something more out of that, we will see later. But this is the basic 
understanding of the two olive trees and the candle the one candlestick with seven lamps and the two olive trees feeding the oil the oil is the spirit of god and anointed ones they're anointed with oil so they're feeding the oil into the the the, the lampstand is like the church shining the gospel in the world and these are the two that are feeding it oil for light okay so now the flying roll this this um is going to speak more to this um starting in chapter five then i turned and lifted up my eyes and i looked and behold a flying roll so in those days, they didn't have books that were bound like this. They would write it on one long sheet and it would be rolled up. It would be either papyrus made from Egypt or it could be leather, like sheepskin leather. And they would just make these long rolls and it would be rolled up and that was a book. So he said, okay, what see you? And I said, a flying roll. The length is 20 cubits and the breadth 10 cubits. And he said to me, this is the curse that goes over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that steals shall be cut off on one side according to it. And everyone that swears shall be cut off on that side according to it. This book is a curse that goes over the whole earth and condemns everybody. And no matter what you do, on one side, you're either lying or you're breaking an oath. If you break an oath, then if you don't break an oath, you're lying. You know, it's a paradox. So what is this paradox? What is this scroll? This is the, the law of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus. If we look at the law coming from the mouth of Jesus, and um, we could do a whole other video on this too, but I'll give a, a, some examples here. Okay. Uh, let's look at some of the New Testament. I'm going to put a bookmark here. Some of the New Testament. John chapter 3, you know, the verse that's so famous, John 3.16. Everyone loves that verse, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And we're going to continue a little bit. We're going to look at 3.16 to for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but that he that does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God. So there you go. It's, there's the light from the candle, and there's the, the condemnation of the world, all in one spot. Okay, there's some more things we can take a look at as far as the swearing of oaths and lying. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. They, those were the words of Jesus, by the way. Matthew 5, 33. Now, Matthew 5 is the, ser the Sermon on the Mount, which is very famous. It's Jesus teaching, giving his law to the world. And we'll just take a few examples out of it. 
verse 33. Again you heard it has been said by them in old time, You shall not forswear yourself, but shall perform unto the Lord your oaths. So if you swear an oath, you have to perform it. But I say to you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the great city of the king. Neither shall thou swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white or black, but let your communication be let your yes be yes, and let your no be no, for whatever is more than this comes of evil. So what's it say? What's the flying scroll? Everyone that steals shall be cut off on one side, and everyone that swears shall be cut off on the other side. Okay? Uh, now about stealing, okay? book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 9 and 10. This is a famous story about Jesus healing a blind man. And this will fit right into the very next part of Zechariah's prophecy. So, I'll read it very quickly. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, Neither has this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spit, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. Now this was a pool in Jerusalem um, that was like a healing pool. And uh, so he told him, Go wash your face in this healing pool. And he went his way, therefore, and washed, and he came out seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Isn't this the one that sat and begged? Some said, This is him. Others said, He's like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go in the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. And they brought uh, him to the Pharisees, the guy that was blind, that what used to be blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now you know the Sabbath day is one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, on every seventh day shall be a Sabbath, which is Saturday. Um, it's from Friday sunset till Saturday sunset. And, and on that day you shall not do any work, and you shall rest. And your slaves and your men servants shall rest, and everything shall have a rest. Um, so... It was on the Sabbath day that Jesus made the clay and put it on the guy's eyes. Then again the Pharisees asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such a miracle? And there was division among them. And they said to the blind man again, What do you say of him, that he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How does he now see?
And his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. Or who has opened his eyes, we don't know. He is of age, ask him. Let him speak for himself. These wor- words his parents spoke because they feared the, Jew- the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man confessed that Jesus was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. Then again they called the man that was blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. They're saying, We know Jesus is a sinner because he broke the Sabbath. He made clay on the Sabbath, right? And he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, that I was blind and now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you did not hear. Why would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You, you are his disciple. We are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this guy, we do not know where he is from. The men answered and said to them, Why, here is a marvelous thing that you don't know from where he is, and yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if any man is a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he, could do, he couldn't do anything. They answered and said to him, You were altogether born in sin, and do you teach us? And they cast him out, because they believed that he was born blind because of sin. That's like the apostles were asking Jesus, right? And Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he that talks with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that they which don't see might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard those words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Verily, verily, or truthfully, I say to you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. But he that enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they don't know the voice of the strangers. And this bar- this parable Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what things they were which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, he said, Truthfully I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. 
But he that is a hireling or a hired servant and not the shepherd doesn't own the sheep. And when he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep, the hired servant flees because he is a hired servant. He doesn't care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I have and I am known by mine as the father knows me even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and the other sheep I have which are not of this fold them also I must bring that's talking about the gentiles that came later later on after his crucifixion and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And this is the joining together of Ephraim and Judah into one stick, right? Therefore does my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment I have received from my father. And there was division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He has a devil and is mad. Why do you hear him? Others said, These are not the words of him that has a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Okay, so uh, we can go on and on, but we sort of get it now about the thief, right? The thief is someone who comes to have righteousness before God without Jesus Christ. It cannot be done. So this is what's speaking to this curse that goes over the whole world, which come out of the mouth of Christ. The curse of um, anyone who swears an oath on one side, you can't swear an oath. You can't keep an oath. And if you think you're swearing an oath, you are a liar and a thief right so that's the flying scroll now in contrast to the flying scroll we have this woman in a basket in chapter 5 so what is the woman in a basket the angel that talked with me went forth and said to me lift up your eyes and see what is this that goes forth and i said what is it and he said this is a basket that goes forth an ephah, that's a measuring basket. It, it was a, an Egyptian, actual, an Egyptian measurement. It was a certain basket of a certain size that was used to measure grain. So an ephah was a measurement of grain, right? Okay, this is an ephah that goes forth. And moreover, he said, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Okay, this is their gospel, right? So first he talked about the flying scroll. That's my gospel. Now he's saying this is their gospel. Okay? Um, because an FF, the, the measurement of wheat, uh, remember Jesus said we are the wheat, right? The harvest of the wheat. And, and Christian Christians are the harvest. So this is a measurement, it speaks to judgment. And he's saying, okay, this is their judgment. Now I'm going to show you what their judgment is, okay? And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this was a woman that sits in the midst of the basket. So it's a woman which is a church, right? It's the wife of God. It's, it's, this is their church, okay? And lead, um, there's some references in Scripture I'll just give you if you want to look them up. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 18, okay? Lead is the dross from silver. So, uh, there's a principle where God says, I will refine you like silver in the fire of affliction. Um, 
So you, when you go through troubles in your life and affliction, you are being refined like by God. He's refining you. He's making you into a better person. And it's being refined like fine silver or fine gold. So when you refine the metal, you melt it in a pot and you mix um typically they probably mix salt with it it's a chemical reaction that occurs and it will separate the the pure silver from the other stuff and the other stuff that gets separated out is mostly lead so lead is the dross it's it's what's taken out of the silver to make it fine silver okay so the basket, their measuring basket, has the, the lead lid. Okay. And he's, he opened the basket and there's the woman sitting there. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the middle of the basket and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth of it. So there's the church in the basket and the lead, the dross, you see, so he refined his church. The people that came out of Babylon are the silver. They came back to, to Zion to become the daughter of Zion. The ones that stayed in Babylon, they are the daughter of Babylon. Okay. Um, and I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, there came out two women and the wind was in their wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. And I said to the, now between heaven and earth is between mankind and God. Okay, this is this wicked woman is between mankind and God. Okay, and I said to the angel that talked with me, where do these bear the basket? And he said to me to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. So this is in Babylon. The land of Shinar is southern Mesopotamia. Sumer. It's the land of Sumer. Okay? So um, this is the, the church that will be set on its own base apart from Zion. And it's in Sumer. And that was the Babylonian community that refused to come back to God. They were put, uh, uh, this curse is put on them, right? So the Babylonian community, they made what's called the Babylonian Talmud. Um, the Talmud is like a, a book of law written by the Jewish scholars beginning at that time since the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's basically um, a manual. It's, it's extremely long and it's about how to keep God's law without the temple. You know, what do we do now? How do we keep God's law? So they started to write this Babylonian Talmud and they wrote it for centuries. They kept adding. Rabbis would add to it. And um, the chief rabbi, I suppose, every chief rabbi would add his wisdom to this. And they, they have this as a collection of wisdom about how to keep the law of Moses without a temple and, and how to move on from the destruction of the temple. So... That is the woman in the basket. This was the enemy of Jesus Christ. This is the opposition who condemn, who rejected and condemned Jesus Christ. Um, so the flying roll is the curse coming forth from the mouth of Christ to anyone who does not believe in him and, and become his servant. And the woman in the epaph is the opposition to him. So let's take a look. Here's the Jewish Virtual Library. 
And we have a look here at the Babylonian Talmud, the full text of it. And there it is, uh, just an overview. This is the table. This is the table of contents, and you see uh, basically all of these are the books. Okay, this is purities, uh, oral law, the Tanakh. Uh, so let's take a look at this first one here. Oh, okay, just just to get an idea of. I don't want to put you to sleep by looking at too much of this, but there's Shabbat, the Sabbath, okay? So we'll take a look at the Sabbath, okay? This is all about the Sabbath, 24 chapters, all right? Let's take a look at uh, chapter 1. Regulations regarding transfer on the Sabbath, okay? That's a trade, I guess. Boom, 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 boom. There you go. All about, this is all about trading on the Sabbath, okay? How about chapter two? Regulations concerning Sabbath and Chanukka light. Where was this table of contents I saw before? Regulations regarding transfer on Sabbath. Uh, regulations concerning Sabbath and Hanukkah light. Uh, let's just keep, take a quick look here. Go down. Uh, this is all about Sabbath, okay? Throwing from one ground to into another. Building, plowing on the Sabbath. Weaving, tearing, hunting on the Sabbath. Uh, catching of reptiles, animals, and birds, tying and untying knots on the Sabbath. Uh, it just goes on and on and on, every single little thing. Sabbath while traveling. Uh, a man who is overtaken by dusk on the eve of the Sabbath while traveling and concerning feeding cattle. Um, you know, waiting for the close of the Sabbath and attending to a corpse, uh, clearing off of crumbs from the table on the Sabbath. You know, this is just like how deep this law goes. This is this is the the law that these Pharisees were were following on here. That they said, well, Jesus can't make the clay to heal the, guy, the blind guy's eyes, because he made clay. Um, Jesus' rebuttal to them about the Sabbath was, is it unlawful to do good on the Sabbath? And he said, which one of you, if his sheep falls in a hole on the Sabbath, won't rescue the sheep? Um, you know, it, the Sabbath is made for people to do good and to have rest and enjoy themselves. You know, but these people have turned it into this nightmare. Nightmare of rules and regulations that, that are just endless. So, you know, I don't know about Jews today on how it works for them. I, I really don't know anything about it. But um, this is what Jesus was up against. Um, I know now they have a Jerusalem Talmud, which uh, I guess, I, I think that was written since the destruction of Jerusalem the second time. So I don't know what's in that. But this is the Babylonian Talmud. This is the law that they used to judge Jesus. And Jesus, his law is the flying scroll and this here is the basket with the wicked woman in it that's that's their resemblance in the earth the the um, daughter of babylon so that concludes chapter five so let's take a quick look at chapter 6. We have to get through chapter 6. Uh, 
And I turned and lifted up my eyes, and look, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. Ah, okay. Um, so the four chariots, that's the same like four horsemen, um, the God sending out these chariots to, to go do something, okay? Um, brass is, uh, okay, this prophecy is given in the Bronze Age, and brass was used for helmets and shields and body armor, um, it's the armies, it's, it's, it's two mountains of brass, uh, the two armies uh, in the Bronze Age, right? And, okay, in the first char chariot were red horses, which we uh, saw as war. The second chariot were black horses, and the third chariot was white horses, and the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. And I answered, and I said to the angel to talk with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are the four spirits of heaven, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The black horses go forth into the north, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth towards the south. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence and walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through, through the earth. And he cried upon me and spoke to me, saying, Behold, these that go towards the north have quieted my spirit in the north country. Okay, so here's the four horses the four chariots um, there's red black white and grizzled and bay bay is like um, like a ginger colored horse uh, grizzled is is a rough rough skin um, a rough surface so it's like a rough surface and it's like a ginger horse Okay, so um, now the black horses went to the north country. So what's black represent? Well, we go back to the book of Revelation, the four horses. Chapter 6. And... Verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard a third beast say, Come and see, and behold, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay, so... This has got to do with this rider on the black horse. Okay, it's not a penny. That's an English translation. It was actually a denarius. In, in the time of Christ, they used a denarius. But it's the same thing. Like, it's the same price. Okay, what, what the idea here is, a measure, that's the ephah, right? The measuring basket to measure grain. Okay, so a basket, one basket a week for, one basket of wheat for a penny, or three baskets of barley for a penny. So he's got this scale, a measuring, a weigh scale, like it's the, the one with the, that goes heavy on one side or heavy on the other. That's how they would weigh things. So, uh, on one side of the scale is one basket of wheat, and then the other side of the scale is three baskets of barley. Okay? So that he's weighing the three baskets are equal to a penny, and the wheat is equal to a penny. Right? So he's measuring this to say, okay, uh, these are of equal weight, 
because they're both worth a penny. So let's take a look. The weight of wheat and the weight of barley. How does that work? Are they actually even? Is wheat three times the weight of barley? Okay, here we got Ray Glenn Commodities Incorporated, okay? Now, what's the weight of barley? How many pounds a bushel? Barley is 48 pounds a bushel, okay? What's the weight of wheat? Uh, that's buckwheat's a bit different. Uh, rye, wheat, 60 pounds. 60 pounds of wheat for per bushel. So wheat is 60 pounds, barley is 48 pounds per bushel. For, per bushel. So three bushels of barley is not equal to one bushel of wheat. Uh, three times 48 Three times 48 is 144 pounds. So on one side of the scale, he's got 144 pounds of barley. And on the other side of the scale, he's got 60 pounds of wheat. So it's like the barley is more than double the weight of the wheat. So the rider on the black horse So the rider on the black horse is showing uh, corruption. That he's got the scale in his hand, and on one side is 140 pounds of barley, and on the other side is 60 pounds of wheat, and they're both worth a penny, but they're not even on the scales. So he's, this is speaking about corruption in trade, right? So the black horse represents corruption, okay? Um, the black horses, now look at uh, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 6. The black horses which are there go forth into the north country and the white go after them. So there's, first there's corruption, and then there's peace, okay? And the grizzled go forth towards the south. And the bay, the grizzled and bay, uh, and the bay went forth, the bay are the ginger horses, they went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. So, um, in the south was Egypt, and in the north, uh, the, the war near the, in the, you see, after Darius I died, his son Xerxes, his son Xerxes uh, uh, started the greatest battle in history against Greece, okay? And this is where we have the famous uh, Greco-Persian wars that went on, um, starting there. Now, um, Egypt in the south, they were always revolting and being put down, and revolting and put down. That's the basic history. So that, that to me, is sort of the grizzled horse. It's a rough surface, right? Nothing smooth about it. Uh, Egypt uh, were always put under uh, control, but every chance they got, they revolted and they had to keep being, it kept going back and forth, um, the, the um, political power. And in the north, um, the last king of... Uh, Persia was Darius the third 
and he was over he was conquered by Alexander the Great of Greece and Darius the third by the time of his kingship Persia was so corrupt that Alexander the Great was welcomed as a liberator a liberator from corruption um, Darius the third he was when Alexander went out to battle against Darius the third Darius the third ran and he left his wife and kids behind and Alexander the Great captured his wife and kids and he um, you know he took he, he, Alexander took care of them out of respect but it, that was a great um, um, embarrassment to Darius the third and I think it shows the, the level of corruption so if you look at the history, you'll see in the north country, which is around Syria, Syria up into Afghanistan would have been northern Persia. Um, but it was in Syria where the, the main battles began taking place. And it was just very corrupt. The, uh, Persia ended with great corruption. So in the north was the black horse. And in the south was the grizzled horse. Okay. So this is speaking of the um, the the four chariots and the and the between the mountains of brass. So these are brass armies, right? And and this is speaking of the the wars that are coming, the Greco-Persian wars. And in the south, the um, the the constant. Um, problems with Egypt so this is these are the forces coming against Persia okay now um, so at the end of it he says then cried he upon me and spoke to me saying behold these that go towards the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country because remember he was jealous that they were so they were bringing in so much peace but it was a peace under lies and under false gods and it was not leading to anything good so he's saying okay the, these wars now are are quieted my spirit this is the way it really happens in satan's kingdom right um We'll look at Daniel later. Daniel also speaks of uh, struggles um, in Persia between the angels. So now starting in verse 9 is the final vision. And this is yet another vision of the high priest. Okay. Joshua. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Take them of the captivity, even Heldai of Tobijah, and Jediah, which are come from Babylon, and come the same day and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, and take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the high priest. So this is again Jesus, the high priest. So he's saying, okay, now I looked up these names of these people. Um, Tobijah, we'll look at this, uh, we'll talk about the names after. These names up here, um, they're people that came from the captivity, and they're different families. Some of them are more significant than others, okay? So he said, okay, now go take the, the crowns and put these crowns, these are four crowns of gold, and put them on the head of the high priest. Okay? And speak to him, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, Jesus, right? And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Okay? So now he's, now he's showing a crowned high priest with a crown of a king, and calling him the branch that shall build the temple of the Lord. 
Okay. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Who both? Between the priest and the king. Okay. And the crowns shall be to Halem and to Bijah and Jediah and Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Now, the significant one here is Tobijah, because Tobijah was one of the Samaritans that was against um, trying to stop the building of the temple. He was one of the leaders of this um, stopping of the building. And he was also... Uh, kicked out of the priesthood because he was polluted his his blood was polluted and he rebelled right um and jediah was a priest of the house of joshua he was another one who the crown represents um some of these other ones um um there's not much about them, but they came from Babylon. The main one is Jediah and Tobijah. Because Jediah shows a, like a pure priest that he was okay. And Tobijah shows a priest that was found to be uh, mixed with Ammonite blood. Now the Ammonites um, were... were uh, because the Ammonites opposed Israel when they were marching into the promised land with Moses. Uh, God said that no Ammonite could ever be a Jew, that they were, they were cut off from Israel forever. So this Tobijah was actually part Ammonite, and he was kicked out of the priesthood for, be, for having polluted blood. So he rebelled and came. Uh, he was always um, opposing uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel. So this crown represents Tobijah, one of the crowns. So this is Jesus. He's a ruler even over the Ammonites. He's a ruler over the polluted blood and the pure blood. It's like he he's making it one kingdom and this is speaking about the gentiles and the jews all being one kingdom right um then and here he summarizes it at the end um in verse 15 he's saying they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the lord and you shall know that the lord of hosts hath sent me to you and this shall come to pass if you will dil diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So this is speaking of Jesus ruling over even the polluted blood. And it doesn't matter anymore that he can even cleanse that. Um, this is God's daughter of Zion, which he is building in opposition to Satan's kingdom. Now, to end this, I'm just going to um, quick, briefly take a look at the book of Hebrews, uh, where he speaks about Jesus as the high priest, okay? For every high priest, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for he himself also is compassed with infirmity, and by reason thereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, like Aaron. Right? 
so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten thee. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Um, if you look at Hebrews chapter 7, it speaks about um, the Levitical priest the Levitical priesthood and the high priest, and he also speaks about the priesthood of Melchizedek. Um, Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God, which met Abraham in the plain after he rescued Lot and all the slaves that were taken captive by these armies. And Melchizedek came and brought bread and wine for everyone. And he blessed Abraham. So Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay. And um, in Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 11, we say, okay. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there is made a, necessar there is made a necessity of a change also of the law. For he uh, of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident that for the, after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifies, and this is speaking about Psalms 110, where uh, David's psalm, he says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So David is saying that this, uh, this ruler would be a priest forever under the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so... Uh, carrying on with Hebrews, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness of it, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made the priest, for these priests were made without an oath, but this is with an oath by him that said to him in Psalm 110, The Lord swore and will not repent, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. The, the Levitical priests, right? They, they died, so there was many of them. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore he is able to save them to the utmost that come to God by him, seeing he lives forever to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law makes men high priests which have infirmities, but the word of the oath which was since the law makes the Son who is consecrated forevermore. So if we look back at Zechariah, we look back here at Zechariah chapter 3, 
there is a priesthood of Joshua who was a sinner and who God made intercession for. That represents the Levitical priesthood. And then if we look at chapter 6, we see again the high priest who is crowned and who is all who who is not cleansed from sin so this represents the priesthood of melchizedek right so between them between this these two priesthoods that are mentioned by zachariah there's a vision of the the two olive trees feeding the candlestick so these two priesthoods are the olive trees and the flying roll and the wicked woman in the basket this is the the woman in the basket is is reckoned with the levitical priesthood which ended and the flying roll is reckoned with the priesthood of melchizedek which goes on forever so this is sort of the a key to understanding um, how God is going to make Zion the kingdom of peace in the earth. So hopefully, like, it's pretty deep stuff and pretty complicated, but hopefully I gave you enough information that sort of helps to get through this, to understand this a bit better. And this gives us a, a, a finishing view of Levites and what, what the Levites represent. The Levites were a foreshadowing of the priesthood of Christ, while the King David was a foreshadowing of the kingship of Christ. And then, um, I guess I don't need to go through it all here. In the fourth year of Darius, beginning in chapter 7 of Zechariah, um, you can look at that yourself if you like. Um, it's not really um, so much these symbolic prophecies, but he's talking about um, a higher understanding of the law of Moses, a, a, a step up in the law of keeping law in the spirit and not just in the motions of what you do. Um, and and, and he's, he's pleading with his people to to take the law more serious and, and be more spiritual about it. And, uh, he, and he goes on and he talks about Zion's future king and the redemption of God's people and all these. This is all going into uh, more and more and more deeper about um, the other prophecies, you know, that carry on. Whoa, what happened? My battery died. Well, I think I've said just about everything I needed to. I'll just update a few things that I missed in here. Um, in Zechariah chapter 3, when we were talking about the Levitical priesthood and the first high priest that Satan stood up to oppose, um, God said, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? I skipped that part, so I'll just explain what that's about. The word brand is one of those English words that has taken different forms over the centuries. Um, when we hear brand, the first thing we think of is a cowboy, you know, branding is cows. Um, it's sort of came from the original brand. The original word brand during the time of the King James translation was just a metal rod to used in the fire to move logs around. It was during in the cowboy times that the brand took on the uh, meaning of branding a cow. And then in modern times, the word brand takes on the meaning of like a corporation's brand, which is related to the cow, right? So in the King James Version, it's simply talking about a poker, uh, like
like a metal rod used to move the logs in the fire. So when Satan is opposing and saying, this is a sinner, this is a sinner, he can't be the high priest. And God's rebuke to him is, is this not a brand taken out of the fire? So the, the high priesthood, the, the fire is the purification. The, you know, you use fire to purify metal, like silver, right? So the fire is the, 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 the affliction, the fire of affliction. So the brand that is the priesthood, is this, is this not something used to move things through the fire of affliction? So it's not something that carries sin in and of itself. It's a symbolic thing, symbolic of something higher. So then God says, and, and here's another symbol, take away the filthy rags of his clothes and give him clean clothes. This is forgiveness. I forgave you of your sin. It's that simple. There's nothing else to do. I forgive you. That's all it takes. So that's the brand. Isn't this a brand taken out of the fire? This, the, the priesthood. Now, the other thing we're looking at is the two priesthoods shown by Zechariah, the Levitical priesthood first, and then later the priesthood of Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, the king of peace. He's the king priest. These two, the two witnesses, are two trees. So what does a tree represent? A tree is something that stands for many generations. It's the office, the office of priesthood. It's, it's, it's a long-standing structure, um, a long-standing tradition, or a long-standing office. So the one is the Levitical priesthood, which stands through many generations of priests. And then there's the priesthood of Melchizedek, which stands forever as one priesthood, as um, without beginning or end. So that's the two trees that are feeding the Holy Spirit into the candlestick, which is the church. So just as a takeaway, an ending note for those who are looking at the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, that when the two witnesses are dead, and all the people start sending gifts to each other because the two witnesses who kept condemning them are dead. Um, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Away in a manger. No crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. He never had any fire coming out of his mouth. And Santa's coming with your gifts. I think it's related to that. Um, so the two witnesses are basically the two priesthoods which represent the Judaism and Christianity. They represent the Levitical and Melchizedek priesthood. And they are all culminated in Jesus Christ. So, I'll see you in the next video. Like, share, and subscribe.